I'm here for other children. I'm here because I care. I'm here because children everywhere are suffering and because 40,000 people die each day from hunger. I'm here because those people are mostly children. We have got to understand that the poor are all around us and we're ignoring them. We have got to understand that these deaths are preventable. We have got to understand that people in third world countries think and care and smile and cry just like us. We have got to understand that they are us. We are them. My dream is to stop hunger by the year 2000. My dream is to give the poor a chance. My dream is to save the 40,000 people who die each day. My dream can and will come true if we all look into the future and see the light that shines there. I've been here for about a month and a half now and this is definitely the most difficult situation that I've ever seen. Um, in the time that I've been here, um, children have been shot and killed. Um, on the 30th of January, the Israeli military bulldozed the two largest water wells, um, destroying over, over half of Rafa's water supply. Um, every few days, if not every day, houses are, are demolished here. Um, people are economically devastated because of the closure of the borders into Egypt and the extreme control of the Gazan economy by Israel. Um, I saw it. I came to, um, to look at the aftermath of a place where 25 greenhouses had been demolished on the other side of Rafah, um, destroying the livelihoods of about 300 people. Uh, and that had taken place while they rounded up about 150 men, uh, held them under a sniper tower, and, and shot around them to contain the men, the farmers in the area. Um, so I feel like what I'm witnessing here is a very systematic um, destruction of people's ability to survive. Um, and that is incredibly horrifying. Sometimes um, it takes a while for it to set in what is happening here um, because I think many of the people here, they try to maintain what they can of their lives and I think, I don't know, maybe it has to do with protecting their children, that they try to be happy, um, joke with their children. So sometimes it takes um, it takes time to to it's hard to hold in your mind, you know, the the complete reality of what's happening here. Sometimes I'm sitting down to dinner with people, and I just realize that um, that there is a massive military machine surrounding them and trying to kill these people that I'm having dinner with, these families that I'm sitting down to to eat with and who are being very generous and kind to me and their children here who are incredibly threatened, um, living lives that no child ever should have to live. Um, and and so it, I feel a lot of horror, really I feel a lot of horror about the situation. The current Israeli government, I don't have a great deal of, of faith that that they're going to listen to any message from me. Um, I think it has become clear that their, this government does not care about the safety of its own people and doesn't care at all about the lives of Palestinian people. Um, I think it's, a, it's ridiculous that my government supports this government and referred to Ariel Sharon as a man of peace. Um, it's clear to me, being here, that Ariel Sharon is invested in perpetuating a cycle, well, perpetuating violence. Um, I think calling it a, a cycle of violence disregards the imbalance of power in this situation, that people's lives here are almost completely controlled by the Israeli government. And it's amazing that people are able to hold on to their humanity as much as they have.
so again, the question is, who are they fooling? Uh, now, one might argue that these this policy is good for allowing the elites in the Arab and Islamic world, especially in countries like Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia, to resist pressure from the public. Because when people down below begin to holler about the fact that Israel has nuclear weapons, the elites can say, it's not clear that they have nuclear weapons. So what this policy of opacity provides is plausible deniability. Uh, I guess you can make that argument. Uh, uh, it was probably somewhat effective in the past, but I don't think it's very effective now, in large part because of the internet. I'm a big believer that the internet has been a game changer. And if you rely on the mainstream media and mainstream publications for your information, you're not going to learn very much about Middle East politics, especially when it comes to Israel. But we have all of these websites and blogs, and we have the Israeli press and so forth and so on. We can just learn all sorts of things about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Middle East politics more generally that you can't learn in the mainstream media here in the United States. Uh, and the end result of this is, I think, the cat is out of the bag on this one, and everybody kind of understands it. So the Israelis can pretend, and we can pretend, that it doesn't matter. I mean that, that, that Israel doesn't have uh, nuclear weapons, but I don't think it buys you very much. Now, to pick up on Grant's comments, he indicated that it may help in the United States because it allows policymakers in Washington uh, to pretend uh, that Israel doesn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, and he was complaining about the fact that it, uh, its policy of opacity undermines accountability. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it matters much at all because there's no accountability for Israel on any issue. They don't need opacity. <laughs> Listen, if I went to the Middle East and visited Israel, I was killed. Somebody shot me there. Do you think there would be any accountability? <laughs> Seriously. If any of you went to the Middle East and were killed, do you think there would be accountability? There wouldn't be. This is how outrageous this situation is. Just think about the liberty. Think about Rachel Corey. Think about this Turkish American who was just killed in the flotilla. There's no accountability. Israelis can do almost anything and get away with it. So the idea of opacity matters. I don't think so. The lobby basically believes it can finesse any issue. They've never seen an issue that they can't finesse. Look at what they did with the Goldstone. Judge Goldstone. Right? I followed this issue very carefully. And he asked me to put my strategist hat on. I mean, if you know, I went to West Point, I was in the military for 10 years, and I cut my teeth in this business by doing military matters. The first time I ever went to Israel was to study what happened in the 67, 73, and actually the 56 wars. I can tell you in great detail how those wars were fought. I followed what happened in Gaza in 2008, 2009. Judge Goldstone, if anything, was too soft on the Israelis. Anybody who followed this carefully knows that he basically got the story right, and again, to the extent he was wrong, he should have been tougher on the Israelis. You saw what happened to Judge Goldstone. This is how powerful the lobby is. Alan Dershowitz was correct, right, when he said that Jews of my generation created who was perhaps the most powerful interest group in the history of democracy. Remarkably powerful. So I think you don't want to put too much emphasis on opacity. It matters on the margins, or it mattered once on the margins, but not very much. Alison Weir is the president of the Council on National Interest and the executive director of If Americans Knew, which is a think tank dedicated to informing people about the Middle East and its conflict. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alison Weir. Thank you. Where, where and how did this all start? And how did the U.S. get such a uniquely special relationship with a tiny country without resources? How did this happen? Well, one of the first things I learned was that when, when I was born, there was no Israel. So where did this come from? Well, what I discovered was that there was a movement uh, that began over a century ago and began operating in Europe and in the United States. It was, a, was and is a political movement that has profoundly and negatively impacted our country. It has tragically impacted the Middle East and it has dangerously impacted the entire world. And yet most of us, I think, have never heard of it and could certainly not define it. It's political Zionism. This was a movement to create a Jewish state in Palestine. It began in the late 1800s. Well, let us look at Palestine in the late 1800s. It was what we largely think of now as a somewhat multicultural land in that it was about 80% Muslim, about 15% Christian, and about 5% Jewish, all living together quite successfully. There are mosques, synagogues, uh, churches throughout Palestine, throughout the Middle East, and throughout North Africa. These populations had been living without conflict for centuries. But with this movement was, was created largely in Israel, uh, largely in Europe, and then taken up at the same time in the US, to create a Jewish state on land that was already inhabited in which 95% were not Jewish. Therefore, this would involve, and this was known by the leadership, even though many followers didn't know it, this would mean that 95% of those people were going to be dispossessed by money, if possible, by force, if necessary. This was written in, in Zionist journals early on. Now, my book and my talk concentrates on the U.S. aspect of all of this. What surprised me in my research is how early and how active this movement was in the United States, a movement I'd never heard of, although I was born here, and my parents were born here, and some ancestors go back to the beginning. It turns out that this was a very significant movement long before my parents were born. And then by 1910, there were already 20,000 Zionists in the US. They included lawyers, professors, and businessmen. It was already in 1910, a movement to which congressmen listened. Then in 1912, we had a very significant development. A prominent lawyer named Louis Brandeis became a Zionist. Brandeis not only just be, didn't just become a Zionist, within about two years, he then became the head of world Zionism. This was, a pub, this was public, it's not some secret knowledge, it's just that most of us don't know it. And then within a few years, he was also a Supreme Court Justice, named by Woodrow Wilson. When you're a Supreme Court Justice, you're supposed to resign your various board memberships and affiliations because you're supposed to not have any conflict of interest but be neutral. So he did resign his leadership of world Zionism, but in reality, he continued it. He would receive reports in his Supreme Court chambers by his loyal lieutenants, and then he would give them directives to go out and to uh, follow in work for Zionism. And this is mentioned in a number of very reliable books. If you get my book, you'll see that my book is over half footnotes. It's all cited. By the way, one of his loyal lieutenants also went on to become a very prominent Supreme Court Justice, Felix Frankfurter. So I'd read that. That to me was shocking right there. But then I discovered something more. So I'll give you my citations for this next information so you can evaluate whether you find it reliable or not. 
I, the way I did my research is I, I would read books, then I would look at their footnotes to see where they had gotten that information. Then I would often get those books and read those footnotes and then order those books and read those footnotes and on and on. So one of the books that I read was re really a fairly well-known one, Israel in the Mind of America, published by a very mainstream establishment publisher. And the author was a very mainstream uh, author. He had been diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times. He had been at Harvard. He'd written a number of well-regarded, very establishment nonfiction books. Well, in this book, he had a few pages in which he told about a secret Zionist society that had operated in the United States of which Louis Brandeis, while a Supreme Court justice, had been a leader. So I looked at where he got that information, and I went to that source. It turned out to be from a scholarly journal called the American Jewish Historical Quarterly, a very respected journal. So then I looked at the author. Well, is this a reliable author? Who wrote this very, to me, explosive information? And it turned out to be a, a well-regarded Israeli historian at a, a mainstream uh, Israeli university. She had written an article in 1975 called The Parashim, a secret episode in American Zionist history. Uh, and she told about what this was, an elitist secret society. The word meant Pharisees and separate. They would go around the country and influence people to push this Zionist agenda. By the way, at this time, the Jewish population were not the Zionists at all. The large majority were not Zionists. Many were opposed to Zionism. This was a, a very, very fringe uh, element to a certain regard. Then in this secret society, they even had a secret induction ceremony so that when somebody joined this society, and many, their membership included professors and Harvard, you know, recent Harvard graduates and uh, doctors, significant people around the country were sometimes members. And in the initiation ceremony, they were told by the inductor, and they swore to this, until our purpose shall be accomplished, you will be the fellow of a brotherhood whose bond you will regard as greater than any other in your life, dearer than that of family, of school, of nation. As early as November 1915, a leader of the Parashim went around suggesting that the British might gain some benefit from a formal declaration in support of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Those of you who have heard of the Balfour Declaration that came in 1917 might find this relevant. I'll get into that a little bit more. Let's remember what was going on during this time period now in the world, especially that involved Britain? Well, of course, in 1914 began what was called at that time the Great War of massive carnage. British forces in the first day of the Battle of the Somme lost, according to historians, somewhere around 50,000 to 60,000 men in one day of a battle that went on and on and on. The British and the German, both sides of course, wanted the US to come in on their side to join this carnage. But the American population were that bad thing, they were isolationists. They didn't want to go kill and be killed in a foreign pointless war. In fact, Woodrow Wilson was elected with the slogan, he kept us out of the war. But of course, as you know, with hindsight, no, he didn't. Well, what happened is that the, the Zionists' leaders, some of them, in Britain, a man named Chaim Weizmann, who is quite well known, went to the British government and said, well, we can help you win this war. Now, why would they want to do that? Because the war wasn't just against Germany, it was against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, held Palestine. Palestine was under, under the Ottoman Empire. So by defeating them, the British would, would come into control of, of Palestine. So the Zionists went to the British and said, we can help you get the United States into the war. 
our, our Zionist colleagues in the United States, for example, they said in writing, Louis Brandeis, who is close to President Wilson, can help to do that. In exchange for that, the British did issue a declaration that was quite significant, mild as it may sound. It was really considered a gentleman's agreement. This is written about in a number of books. Just most of us don't know this about our own history. So the Balfour Declaration was basically a promise that the British would help to facilitate the Zionist objective of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. After the British, of course, did win, then at the Paris peace talks, the Zionists pushed to uh, push this wording into the mandate in which Britain took charge of Palestine. Then jumping ahead to some of the American aspects again, then we find during the 30s and the 40s, in Palestine itself, there were some, the violence increased. Naturally, as soon, you know, when there was colonization beginning around the turn of the century to a land with the intention of pushing out the land, the indigenous population at some point is going to wake, out, wake up and there will be violence. That has happened in the early 20s and again in 1929. There was violence between the two populations. Then, uh, then as now, the large number of those killed were the Palestinians. So as the violence increased, there were some terrorist organizations created in Palestine by the Zionists. One of them led by a former, in fact, two of them led by future Israeli prime ministers. And uh, those, those terrorist organizations in Palestine, the Irgun and the Stern Gang, it turns out had front groups in the United States with duplicitous names. And they were funneling massive amounts of money and weaponry to these terror groups in Palestine. They put on major pageants where Supreme Court justices attended and thousands of people attended. They were very prominent. One of them was led by a, a man named Peter Bergson, people thought. His real name was Hillel Cook. He was the operative for the Irgun. I looked into one of the leaders a bit more, just, just because I needed to find out his first name. When you're writing a book, you can't just write someone's last name, you need to know their first name. And I had heard about another leader of, of one of these types of front groups connected to killing in Palestine. And uh, his name was Rabbi Korf, but I didn't know the first name. None of the books that I had had a few paragraphs of them, but none of them gave his first name. So I looked into it on the internet, tried to do various searches, and eventually I came up with a UN report that gave his, his first name, Baruch Korf, and told a little bit about a plot he was part of. Using those search terms, I then could just, you know, put in more information into my search bar, and suddenly all these PDFs of American newspapers popped up, all of these returns. It turned out that Rabbi Baruch Korf was part of a, a, a cell in Paris that was planning to fly an airplane and bomb Britain after the war. Britain that had just defeated Hitler. But they were so angry at the British because the British were not allowing a, a large enough Jewish immigration into Palestine. So they were going to kill the British. So Baruch Korf and his section of the Stern Gang had this plan, but there was one problem. They, they didn't know how to fly an airplane. They weren't pilots. So they needed to find somebody, and they recruited a young American aviator named Reginald Gilbert, I discovered. Reginald Gilbert had been an ace during the war. He was in Paris, and they recruited him to fly the airplane for them. He pretended to go along with the plot, but then he went to the American embassy. And the American embassy in, informed the Paris police and Scotland Yard. So for a week, he pretended to go along with this cell. And then when it came time to actually take off, to fly the plane, to drop these uh, incendiary bombs onto the foreign ministry, they were caught. By the way, the original plan had been to bomb parliament, but then they decided they hated the foreign ministry more. 
And Gilbert at one point had said to them, well, what if I can't find the foreign ministry in, in the London fog? They didn't have this you know, degree of instrumentation we have today, and that was a real possibility. And they said, then just drop them anywhere. Kill anybody. All, of, all British are our enemy. So they were caught. Korf was in prison for a few months in Paris, and he eventually got off. He had very powerful friends in the United States. But I was curious about him. I looked into him some more. To, you know, this was so astounding to me. And none of these, you know, dozens and dozens of books I have, none of them had any, had this story in there at all. And so, in looking at him, I discovered that later in life, he was a friend of Richard Nixon. In fact, it was reported that he had helped to influence Nixon's policies on the Middle East. In fact, Nixon, sort of in a fond way, called him my rabbi. Now, the precursor to today's very powerful Israel lobby was a group called the American Zionist Emergency Council, AZEC. Uh, this was formed in around 1940, and by 1943 had a budget of half a million dollars at a time when a nickel bought a loaf of bread. Within a few years, they had maneuvered their way into access to an even far larger sum in which they had access to $14 million in 1941 and $150 million by 1948. That's the equivalent in today's dollars of a trillion dollars to use to manipulate the United States. So they targeted with that money every sector of US society. Uh, and you know this isn't ancient history. They had annual reports. They had directives. You know all of this was written down on paper. They targeted congressmen, Christian clergy, editors, professors, business and labor, Jewish war veterans. They published uh, books all over. They had 400 local committees. There were massive campaigns throughout the country. They also worked especially to manufacture Christian support. They uh, secretly funded sort of Christian groups that would push the same Zionist ideology. They uh, funded books that became huge bestsellers. It was a, an enormously successful campaign throughout the country. Even though during this time there was a great deal of opposition to Zionism by many different groups, by Christian leaders, by State Department, Pentagon, intelligence agencies, Jewish anti-Zionists, Many people were opposed to it. Two of the most celebrated Christian pastors opposed it on religious and moral grounds. Uh, the Christian leaders in the Middle East had gone to the Paris Peace Talks to advocate on behalf of the Arab population that there should be self-determination of peoples there. Uh, one very prominent American Christian who was a Dead Sea scholar wrote a wonderful book called Palestine is Our Issue, is Our Business. Uh, and, you know, it, it, to read that book, you, it, it's very strong. It talks about the right of return, about Palestinian resistance fighters, etc. But it was buried. Diplomats, the State Department, the military, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies wrote directive after directive, study after study, memo after memo, talking about how damaging to the U.S. and to U.S. strategic interests and how in violation of American principles Zionism would be. Starting from under Taft, there was then a commission to, the, to Palestine during the time of the Paris peace talks. They went there to investigate the situation, to you know, look into the possibility of creating a Jewish state there. And they came back with a very powerful report saying this would be a grave trespass on the rights of the people there. This was entirely buried and uh, had no effect whatsoever. I'll skip through some of these people there in my book. Dean Acheson, a major statesman for many years, wrote that the Zionist agenda would imperil not only American but all Western interests in the Near East. The CIA wrote that they were pursuing objectives that would endanger the strategic interests of the Western powers in the Near and Middle East. There, there's so much evidence of, of this. You know, some people debate about whether the lobby is powerful. It's been powerful since the beginning, and the evidence is all there. It's just buried. Uh, 
Alfred Lilienthal was part of the American Council for Judaism. I had the honor of meeting him. He wrote excellent books about this. That group was, was arguing against Zionism. And part of what they were arguing in the State Department was that there would be massive bloodshed and chaos if this was pushed through. When the Zionists began to work to push through what's called the partition plan through the United Nations, that's portrayed to Americans as this wonderful compromise. Palestinians just you know, ignored this wonderful opportunity that Palestinians pushed through. Well, they, they knew, and the State Department were saying this would be a, a disaster if this gets pushed through. The idea was that, the, that Palestine, half of it would be given to a Jewish state. Even though these were mo mostly recently arrived and had originally only been five of the of the pop five percent of the population, and even after decades of immigration, were thirty percent of the population, and this plan wasn't actually half. The plan was that they would get fifty five percent of Palestine, approximately, and the Palestinians would get about forty five percent of their own land. Now, I know what the Americans would say if the UN did that to us. But this is portrayed with, oh, those foolish Palestinians not accepting that. Um, and by the way, the, many people are under the illusion that Israel bought up all that land. That's what's been told, and that was the attempt. And they did increase Jewish ownership about over, you know, from what was originally about 1% because it was so an urban population to at most 8%. Most historians said they owned about five to six percent. So a group that owned eight percent under this plan was getting 55 percent, a good deal for them. No wonder they said they would go along with it and secretly in their journal said it's the first step, then we will get it all. But rather than bringing peace, which was what the UN was charged with, instead of bringing peace, it did the opposite. It created, of course, still more violence and there was a war that Israel calls its war of independence and Palestinians call it al-Nakba, the catastrophe, because it was a massive humanitarian catastrophe. At least three quarters of a million men, women, and children were very ruthlessly and violently pushed off their land. There were at least 16 massacres before a single Arab army finally joined the fray. And by the way, those of you that grew up with the myth that I did, that little Israel declared its independence and suddenly, you know, five to seven Arab armies suddenly just attacked, but Israel somehow won because God, you know, was on their side or something. Well, in reality, before Israel declared its independence on about May 14th, 15th, it's a midnight type of situation, they had already committed 16 massacres these are quite grisly, you can read the details of them. They had already ethnically cleansed at least 200,000 people. When these Arab armies did come into the fray, they were smaller in number, including the Palestinian forces, than, than the Zionist forces were. And by the way, all, all, virtually all of the battles were actually fought on the part that, according to the UN plan, was going to be Palestinian territory. Now, some people, again, were trying to tell Americans what was going on. One of the most important was a woman named Dorothy Thompson. She was what the, Briti what the Britannica Encyclopedia says was one of the most famous journalists of the 20th century. In fact, I believe at one place they say that she is the most important female journalist of the 20th century. It's true, although I had never heard of her. She had a newspaper column that was printed all over the United States, a radio program that was listened to by millions of Americans. She was such a celebrity that there was a Broadway play in which she was, loose, she was played by Lauren Bacall, and there was a Hollywood movie loosely based on her life in which she was played by Katherine Hepburn. She was considered the most powerful woman in the United States after Eleanor Roosevelt. She was an excellent journalist. She had been a foreign correspondent in Germany during the 30s and had been one of the first journalists to raise the alarm about Hitler. She was the first foreign journalist to be expelled by Hitler. She was therefore very sympathetic to Zionism. 
But after the war, when Israel, when, you know, later when Israel began to be created, she went over to see this wonderful state of Israel, the new Jewish state. And when she got there, she saw hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees living in squalor, dying in large numbers every day. And she began to write of them, to tell about them, to speak about them. She even eventually made a documentary about them. And for telling about these people, for writing about these people, she lost her newspaper column, she lost her radio program, she lost her fame, and she was erased from history. This one is about something that took place on Capitol Hill in 2003. There was a briefing in the Rayburn House office building. The chairman of that briefing was a four-star admiral, Admiral Thomas Moore. He had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a World War II hero, the highest rank a military officer can attain, really, and former chairman of Chiefs, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Also part of the panel was a rear admiral, Merlin Starring who had been in charge of the whole legal department of the U.S. Navy. Also part of their commission was a Marine General. And not just any Marine General, this one was the highest ranking Medal of Honor recipient in the United States. The highest Medal of Valor an American can win. They announced their findings on Capitol Hill that Israel had tried to set a sink a U.S. Navy ship that they had killed 34 Americans and injured over 170 of them, the decks had been running with blood, that rescue flights to these men had been recalled by order of the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States. That this incident, in fact, had been ordered covered up by the President of the United States, and that this attack by Israel constituted an act of war against the United States by Israel. Statements of that gravity by officials of that high rank on Capitol Hill in a House office building are newsworthy. And yet, there was nothing about them in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the allegedly patriotic network, Fox News, we may wish to call why they didn't cover it, the only place that covered those statements was the Stars and Stripes newspaper. That's the military newspaper abroad. And it's in detail in the congressional record. There you can read every word. If I now tried to write an article, maybe about Dorothy Thompson, a fascinating person, or maybe about the Parashim, or maybe about Reginald Gilbert, there's much more I could tell you about, very interesting about him. If I tried to do that, for a popular American history magazine, which I would like to do, I quite likely would not get it published. And that's, you know, this is not paranoid speculation. A few years ago, we tried to put a paid newspaper ad in American history magazine, not about Palestine. We tried to put a paid ad in about a book, a memoir by a 91-year-old American congressman. It tells about his his uh, childhood in Depression-era America, in Corn Belt America, about being a small-town newspaper editor, about serving the Seabees during World War II, about going to Congress, about all his various fights in Congress, and about also, near the end of the book, it tells about the fact that when he started to speak about Palestine, he was targeted by the Israel lobby, money was funded to his opponent, and after 22 years in Congress, he lost the election, Paul Finley. But our advertisement didn't even tell about that last part of his very long life. It just told about his book, you know, with the usual blurbs about what a wonderful book this is. But Eric Weeder, the publisher and owner of American History Magazine, informed us that they would not publish our advertisement in American History Magazine because we were anti-Israel and that they would not publish our advertisement in any of the popular history magazines that they own in the United States, which is virtually every one. 
This is, according to their website, the largest history chain in the world, and it's certainly the largest one in the United States. So what do we do about this? To me, we tell people what's going on. We even talk to those people that we don't want to raise something serious or uncomfortable with, because right now as we're talking, we all know what's going on in Gaza in general. We don't know which child was just killed or lost their parents. We don't know which home was just destroyed, which hospital was further destroyed, but we know what's going on right now. And now we, we know a little bit about what's going on here. But we have the power to change this. I feel strongly that if every single person in the United States right now that is concerned about Gaza would actually just do something like maybe again, or maybe for the first time, phone your senator. If every single one of us did that tomorrow, it wouldn't change the policy overnight, but they would have, they have their fingers to the wind, and suddenly they would realize, whoa, looks like the tide is changing here. And half of them would love it to change. They don't like being APAC puppets. Now some of them, are ideological Zionists, you know, that, that's the reality. But according to a congressman that I talked to a number, few years ago, he said over half in Congress know what they are doing is wrong, but the Israel lo they're afraid of the Israel lobby. In other cases, Congress people have privately told individuals, you need to make me do this, you need to create the grassroots movement so that I can do it. If everyone in America did that, it would begin the impact that would bring change. Thank you very much.